Courtney. Hello everyone, I'm Sue from Casey Cadinia Libraries and thank you for joining us tonight with our, for our author talk with Heather Morris. Hello Heather. Hello. As Courtney said, it's best to keep yourselves muted and um, we need to let you know that we're recording this session, but only Heather and I will be on the screen. Unless you ask a question later when your voice will be heard and you can put your hand up and unmute to ask your question or you can put your question in the chat and I'll read it out to Heather a bit later on. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands where our services and programs take place and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And we can get started. Many of you will already know Heather as the best-selling author of The Tattooist of Auschwitz and Silke's Journey. Today, she's here to talk about her latest book in this trilogy of survival stories, Three Sisters. And we have a copy to give away to one lucky viewer. All you have to do is send an email with the answer to this question, which is, can you name the three sisters? And send that email to In a Nook with a Book, which is our um, Facebook page for readers. And it's the email address is iinwab at cclc.vic.gov.au. And Courtney will put that in the chat for us so you can see it written down. And then if you're the lucky winner, we'll send you a copy or you can pick it up from your local library. So we're going to start with Heather answering this question, which is probably quite a, a long answer. Can you tell us how you came to write The Three Sisters? Hello. Thank you, Sue. Thank you very much, Courtney, and everybody who's tuned in. It's just a delight to be here chatting to you and my stomping ground, Casey Cardinia. That, that's um, where I have a place. I'm here tonight to talk to you about The Three Sisters. But before I do, I actually need to tell you how I got this story. And while Sue mentioned this being a trilogy, it is and it isn't. Yes, the other previous books, Lully's story and Silka's stories, there is a connection there. They both came from Lully. Three sisters came to me quite differently, and I'll tell you why, but they are also connected. And that's that connection that you can read about also in the book. It was June 2019. I was in South Africa in a place called Frontier, which is just outside of Cape Town. For anybody wanting to go there, it's the wine region, okay? And really good wines, I can vouch for them. Well, after a, a day, it was a book festival there, a day of talking and then an evening out with our fellow authors and other participants. And yes, that one of the wineries. So yes, there was a little bit of imbibing going on. But I got home at about one or two in the morning and read an email. It was from a man who lives in Toronto in Canada. He wrote to me telling me that he had picked up a copy of the Tattoos of Auschwitz and taken it to read on a flight to visit his mother in Israel. I am so, so grateful that Canada had the same cover that we have of the Tattooists in Australia. Because if we didn't, I would not be talking to you tonight about three sisters. Only Canada and Brazil out of 55 something countries took the Australian cover. So that when this man arrived at his mum's house in Tel Aviv and the next day came out and left his copy of the book on his mother's coffee table, he wrote to me, you can imagine how surprised I was when my 93 year old mother walked past, looked down at the book and said to him, that must be about Lali Vingita. And when she said, he said to her, how can you possibly know that? And she said, look at the number on the arm of the girl on the cover. Now look at the number on my arm. They're three away. Your auntie Sibby's was two away. We were standing just behind Gita when Lully tattooed us all. We went to school with Gita. We were on the train going to Auschwitz with Gita. They shared a block in Birkenau with Gita. So when you read that, no matter what the time is, you do not sleep. A couple of emails followed, and within a couple of days, I got a message saying that Livy, this 93-year-old lady, wanted to talk to me. So I spoke to her on the phone. 
the first thing she said to me was, I have so much I want to tell you about Lali and Gita. And then she folded it up with, I don't like talking on the phone, so you have to come and see me. Sure. Uh, just a technical problem. I am currently in South Africa. I live in Melbourne. But um, I'm sure that can be done. done. There was a situation where for the next couple of days, I emailed my publishers in London with, what do I do? Now, I, here's the story I've heard so far in emails. And they agreed with me that, yes, I should go to Israel and meet this woman. So I never came home from Johannesburg. I flew direct to Tel Aviv. I had no idea where I was or what I was. I had no money. I just spoke no language. But within a few hours of arriving there, I walked into the apartment and into the arm of Livy and her family. And then all the other families. There's four generations of the Mala girls now living in Israel. Four generations. What a legacy, eh? Pretty special. From children to grandchildren to great-grandchildren. I want to tell you a little bit about all of them and how they played a role in my also getting this story. So I was there for oh, about three days and I spent all day with the families. They would come into Libby's apartment uh, and meet me and talk to me. There is Livia. She's, current, she's 95. Magda, she's 97, nearly 98. And Sibby, the oldest who about two weeks ago would have turned 99, but she died in 2014. So I have not met Sibby, but I have met her two sons and their wives and their children and their grandchildren. And this is the family that has been responsible for giving me this incredible story. How does it connect to Lali and Gita? Well, I've just told you that these girls, these sisters, they knew Gita. So for Livy, she thought she should be telling me more about Lali and Gita because the relationship with Gita didn't end when the Holocaust ended and they went their separate ways. They went back to Slovakia and ultimately to Israel and Gita ended up in Melbourne. But Gita visited Israel several times, even stayed with Magda and the sisters together with other Holocaust survivors got together in Israel. So they had continued their friendship and their relationship and, of course, it's in the days of writing letters too. So, yeah, a lot of correspondence took place between the girls. You know, well, I presume you know Lolly's story. He was the tattooist, the tattooist of Auschwitz. And she, he numbered those girls, just like he did Gita. Silka's story came from Lolly's story because Lolly insisted I tell her story. But this is how the stories are now starting to connect. Because when I started talking, of course, to the girls, I call them the girls, okay? For the record, Livia, Magda, Sibby. Surely some of you are writing it down if you want to read the book. Um, they are connected. And, of course, I spoke to them about Silka. Did you know Silka? And, yes, they did. Not the same way Lali and Gita did. They knew her. They knew who she was and they knew what her role in Auschwitz-Birkenau was. So those other characters, of course, are woven into their story. Let me tell you about the story. I'm going to give away some spoilers, but they're spoilers, I think, that will help you to decide whether or not you want to read this because it's going to tell you where the story goes, how it starts and where it ends. It travels and it covers a lot more than Lully's story and, and timeline. It starts with a promise three little girls made to their father. They were three, five, and seven. Livy, now at 93, she or 95, she maintains she remembers making the promise, and Magda kind of smacks her around and says, You can't possibly, you were three, you wouldn't even sit still. But what she remembers is having been told by her two older sisters nearly every day of their lives, remember the promise to Papa, because it was that promise that helped them not only get through the Holocaust, but their entire life, the promise to Papa. Why is it significant? And here's the first spoiler. You could pick the book up at any bookstore and you'd read the first two or three pages and you'd get it, and at that point, um, you'll either continue to buy the book and read it or not. 
Why it's significant is that the next day their father died. Now that was a pivotal point in their lives, now losing their father. So that promise became all the more significant to them. So in April 1942, the Halinka Guards, which were the Slovakian form of the SS, came to take Livy away, 15 years of age, guys, 15. They came to get the girls, and when they came and to tell them that they had to report to go and work for the Germans, only Livy was home. Sibby, she was 19. She had already made a decision, along with other young Jewish boys and girls in their hometown, that they wanted to go to the promised land. And they had they were part of a group which continues today. It's a, a, a group of young Jewish boys and girls who do what's called Hashara learning, and that is survival training. So Sibby's off in the flor- forest with others learning how to survive so that they can go to the promised land. Magda had got unwell a couple of days earlier. A Christian doctor has said to her mum, I don't like what I'm hearing, what's going on with Jewish boys and girls in our town. Let me put her in hospital. It may save her. Sibby's in the forest. I'll put Magda at 17 into the hospital. Surely Livy at 15 is too young. They won't take this tiny little thing to work. Oh, how wrong he was. They didn't care. They came for Livy. But Sibby had come home from the forest a couple of days earlier. And she said, no way is my baby sister going on her own. And so without her name being on that list, that fateful list of probably, I think there were seven or 800 girls from Slovakia that were gathered together in another town called Poprad and then taken to Auschwitz. They didn't know where they were going. That's where they ended up. And of course, when Magda came home from hospital a few days later to discover she was now separated from her sisters with no idea where they were, uh, she was heartbroken. She wanted to be with them because they'd made a promise that they wouldn't be separated, and she couldn't. Now, the story of these girls plays out in that first part. Uh, it was a dual narrative of two dif- the same timeline but of course, there's two different stories taking place. Livia and Sibi are in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Magda, for two and a half years, is back in Slovakia with her mother and grandfather. She's back there, hiding every Friday evening. The Halinka guards would come to the house to find her. They came on Friday evenings because Friday evenings is the Shabbat time. It is the time when all Jewish people are at home indoors before sundown. So that was the perfect time they thought to come and take them. They would find them at home. Magda hid in the forest. She'd sleep overnight. Occasionally a neighbor hid her in the ceiling in her home. For two and a half years, these girls survived separately. The horrors and the evil that Livy and Magda experienced and witnessed. Well, I, I tell you about it, I can't not. But hopefully I tell it to you in such a way that you will turn the page and you will see what's underpinning their survival for those two and a half years. There's not only their love for each other, but the love for their sister who they just need to be reconnected with. I think if they hadn't known that they would then be reconnected in that place, that evil, evil place in auschwitz birkenau um, they probably would have thought differently about wanting to be with her. It's one of those things when talking to the girls and talking to their families, dealing with the guilt, I don't know any other word for it, that Magda experienced by not being with her sisters when she found herself in Birkenau and saw how Livy and Sibby had lived for two and a half years. It, it's been a terrible cross for her to bear while she was sleeping at home in her own bed. Yes, they didn't have much to eat, but they certainly had more than her sisters did. Of course, her sisters, Livy and Sibby, all her lives have told her, you don't get to feel guilty. We were happy you weren't here. 
And that was the difference. They were happy she wasn't. She was angry that she wasn't. But they were reunited in Birkenau. Now, how the hell did they find their sister in this camp? Well, whatever you want to call it, where over 100,000 people were at any given time. It's massive. If any of you have been there, you know what I'm talking about. You stand at the front of Birkenau and you can't see where it begins and where it ends. And they found her. They found her. She was in a section where she wasn't meant to stay. She was really just transiting through Birkenau. They heard that she was there because another girl, a Slovakian friend, recognised her and told Sibi. And Sibi being Sibi, by the way, Sibi, I never met her, but my goodness, from her family and from watching her on a videotape, two-hour videotape, the strength and the courage of this young woman, 19, 19, you're a different age back in the 1940s than you probably are today. How she kept not only herself and Livia alive, but what she did for others and how she, she took it up to the SS. She was gutsy. She was ballsy. And in a place where at any point in time, she could have been shot for just looking the wrong way. She managed to smuggle Magda. This is a few more of the little spoilers, but reading about it is going to be just as much fun as me telling you, trust me. They got her smuggled back to the block where the girls were and hid her in there and then took her to work with them. And then there's a couple of other twists that play out. You're going to go read about them. Hey, listen, by the way, when it comes to anyone who wants to read the, the, the story, can I make a suggestion to you? You start at the end, not reading it, but looking at the photos. I'm so happy that the family have shared with me many, many photos of these girls as young girls, as wives, as mothers, and as a now old woman. And they're there in the, in the book. Have a look at them so you know who it is you're now reading about. Uh, I think all the ones that we've got in the book, I was only the other day I was looking at them, and given that I've seen these for many, many months, and I looked at them and I went, something struck me about them that I hadn't seen before in them. And that is Sibby, the eldest, is in the middle. There she is with a younger sibling either side of her. And just, it wouldn't have been planned that way because every ad hoc the photos, but you can just know that it was an automatic thing for her to be there so she could embrace both her younger sisters and care for them. But here's the other thing about the sisters. While Sibby definitely had that role of being the carer, the person who Livy freely admits kept her alive. She would not have survived in auschwitz birkenau without her. But on the other hand, when I hear Sibby and read her testimony, because she made this testimony for the Shoah Foundation, and I hear the stories about the girls, there were many times that those other two younger siblings stepped up and took over that caring role, that role of being I'm now going to be the protector of the three of us. And that played out not only in Auschwitz-Birkenau, but really importantly on the death march that followed their time there. It plays out today. In some ways, Livy, the baby, she is now the matriarch. She's still got that very much of a, um, look at me, look at me, I'm the baby, everybody run around after me, even at 95. Uh, but on the other hand, she now is the carer. Magda's you know, not in the best of health at 98, but um, to see Livy now taking that role and that matriarchal role is wonderful, but she has played that role many times. 18th of January, 1945, the Russians are coming. The girls, the women, well, the men were marched out of Auschwitz-Birkenau as well, but there wasn't so many of them left that tens of thousands of women and girls, mostly young women, anyone over the age of about 25 never survived there anyway, they were marched out on a death march. You know, I thought the death march, even though Lully was on it and Gita had been on the, on the death march and I read stories from them about it, in my head I thought this is something that just happened over a few days, maybe a, a week or two. 
No, no, I'm talking months. They went from one camp to another camp to another camp as, again, the, the, the Germans tried to get away from the Russians. And so they went deeper and deeper into Germany because Auschwitz-Birkenau is in Poland. So they then crossed over. But here's the thing. On one of those camps, one of those, it's called Rezzo, another concentration camp, Magda went into the administration building and she stole a journal and a couple of pens. That's all I'm going to say about that at this point in time. There came a time on that death march being marched between two different camps that the sisters and several other young girls decided in advance Today's our last day in captivity. Today, we run or we die. And on that march, on those long columns of, of girls and women, they picked a, a moment where they went to the nearest SS officer standing near them or, or walking with them and said, we're going in that direction. We're leaving. He pointed his rifle at Sibby. And they said, shoot us if you must, but we're leaving. When he put his rifle down and walked on, they then quickly hid in the ditch. They'd chosen this place because it had quite a deep ditch on by the side of the road. They hid there while the rest of the column and the rest of the, the Nazis and SS officers went past them. And then they ran into the forest. For many weeks, they, I think they kind of walked around in circles. But they didn't know where they were, but... They went from village to town and village. One day it's the Germans threatening them, the next day it's the Russians, and then it swaps again. The, the, the fighting is still going on overhead, massive aerial fighting going on between the Germans and the British and the Americans. And there they saw this ragtag group of girls trying to get to the Allies, trying to get to safety. I should have written that story as a book in itself, you know, because, it, my gosh, it's um, pretty amazing how they survived. You can read about it in the book, but I'm going to say that there is more now we can add to it. What I don't have in the book are dates and the names of the towns and villages and names of other people with them. That journal that Magda took and hid on the 30th of January, when they ran from the SS, she started writing a diary, a journal, in real time. A few months ago, after 77 years, that diary was found. And, and we now have it written by her in this beautiful Slovakian uh, language, now translated, of which I'm really, really proud to have a copy of. You will see in the back of the book an extract from that diary, just the one extract the one comment that she made at midnight in May 1945 when passing Russian soldiers told them the war was over. Look, even if you just get the book in the library and you don't want to take it out, you want to flick through, <clears throat> look at the photos, read what Magda wrote on the 8th of May 1945. It's utterly, utterly, um, but if you don't get chills, like I'm getting just telling you about it, then, yeah, I don't know. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> I've been talking a bit today. The story doesn't end there, though. No, they finally do get to the Allies. They do get to what was called a displaced person camp in Germany, where the Americans, the Soviets and the British are now dividing this part of Germany up into their zones. That's all well documented in history, how those three nations then decided, okay, spoils of war, <clears throat> we'll all have a little peace. But they all the people. Excuse me. <coughs> mm. uh, I am I do apologize. That's okay. I, You're talking a lot. <coughs> Now I'm good. And that displaced persons camp, the first people they came across, I don't think I put this in the book, but they told me were actually an American soldiers, but they couldn't understand them. The Americans went and got a, a Russian um, interpreter who then interpreted with them and said to the girls, oh, would you want to stay with us or do you want to go with the Russians? 
And Sibby apparently said, oh, we'll go with the Russians. I think they might regret that. Life in America may have been a little bit better, better post-World War II. However, uh, history dictated that they went with the Russians. They were then formed into their nations. The Polish, the German, the Czechoslovakian, the Hungarian, the Greek, all these different nationalities. Now, what happened uh, next when they were then subsequently gathered together to be returned to their home country? I'm going to talk about part of the book and my writing of it. When you're writing a book that's somebody else's story, you don't get to have any input into it, either the words or the emotions of it. There was one point in this book that that didn't happen for me. I didn't realise. I kind of realised, but I didn't. <clears throat> I think I hoped I'd get away with it. When this book was written and it was in first draft, or pretty good first draft, before it went anywhere, it was sent to Israel, to the families there. It was imperative that the sisters, the children, the grandchildren, adult grandchildren, got a chance to read this manuscript and then raise any objections or any concerns they had about my telling the story, my writing. Had I got it right? <clears throat> You know, I said to them when we sent it to them, now this hasn't gone through the, all the real editorial process, so there's going to be typos and uh, yeah, grammar. Don't worry about that. Your, the, your job now is to read the story. Yeah, but two of them still couldn't help themselves, and they sent me back pages and pages of, you've misspelled this word, and I really think if you should have a comma, not a full stop after this. It was hilarious. I thank them very much, but um, I left that up to the experts. But out of the comments that did come back, other than a couple of little tweaks, oh, that was Libby, that happened to, or not Sibby, there was only one thing they said to me, you got it wrong. Libby and Magda said, you got this wrong. And that's this part of the story I'm going to tell you. They were put on five buses, the boys and girls from Czechoslovakia, to be returned to Prague, to their country. The girls told me, and Sibby told me on her videotape, her show tape, about that bus journey back into Prague, how as they approached the Child's Bridge, which it goes over the, the river and into Prague's town. All the way along then, all the streets were lined with thousands and thousands of people. They were throwing flowers onto the bus. When the bus was forced to stop because there was just so many people in its way, they got on board the bus and would press money into the hands of the girls and boys, food, bouquets. And then when the bus did make its way, the five buses into, well, I can never say this properly, Wenceslas Square. <clears throat> Just think of the young, uh, the carol, I mean, uh, yeah, Christmas carol. The mayor was there and thousands and tens of thousands of people were there to greet them and welcome them. Now, I wrote that. And as I was writing it, I got angry. I got really bloody angry. And for me, it was, how dare you? How dare you think that you can welcome these people home when you are the ones who sent them away? You are the ones who are responsible for them now no longer having any family. And I wrote it in a very angry vein. Uh, and that came across that. And I wrote those words along those lines. You, know, you can't buy us for a dollar coin. It doesn't make a difference. Word came back to me. You got that wrong, Heather. You got that so wrong. That was the happiest day of our life. We came home. They came home. And I didn't appreciate the strength of just being back on Czechoslovakian soil meant it was as if everything that had happened before was suddenly pushed back and they were being welcomed home. So rewrite happened and you get to read the rewrite. <clears throat> I think I might have snuck one thing in there from City saying something, <laughs> but they seem to have forgiven me for that. Uh, they weren't to know, of course, that that welcome home, as beautiful as it was, did not play out when they returned to Slovakia, back to the... Slovakian part of Czechoslovakia, back to their hometown where they'd left 
1942 and in Magda's case, 1944. And what greeted them there, the rejection, left the cast out. They went to Bratislava, the capital, and all the stories, by the way, you think, hey, she's telling us the story. We don't have to read this. No, I'm not. I'm not telling you the guts of the story. Trust me. Of what happens at these different places, you, you're only going to get from reading the book, listening to the audio book or, or whatever. Or, you know, maybe one day we'll make a mini series about it. Who knows? In Bratislava, they still struggled to settle down. That's where all the displaced Jewish boys and girls were from Slovakia were returning. There was no point going back to your hometown. They were too small. You were never going to get welcome there. Sibby fell in love. Sibby married. Sibby had a baby. But for the other two girls, particularly Libby, here again, here's our Libby. No, I will not live like this. I am not going to be a second-class citizen any longer. And she persuaded Magda to join her and do what Sibby had been doing all those years earlier, Hashara training to go to the promised land, to out into the forests of Czechoslovakia in the Czech Republic part. Many young Jewish boys and girls went. I love when Livy's telling me about this. She said, we were sent there for survival training. We had to do survival training, she said, for three months. As if surviving in Auschwitz for three years, we hadn't learned a thing. But um, that, that was the rules, and so they did. And then they had to be smuggled the length of Slovakia. Now, thankfully, Slovakia is not that big. It's not like Australia. But still, you've got to remember, this country was now under communist rule. Nobody went outside their, their, their street, their village, without permission. When they got to the border, they had to cross over into now communist-controlled Romania. And again, travel the length of Romania. Again, thankfully, a small country to get to the Black Sea. And there those two girls boarded a boat. They stepped off that boat in Haifa in Israel. At that pivotal point in history when the nation state of Israel was being created. Yeah, they were there, 48, 49, which the historians and the academics have told us all about from the perspective of the military, the United Nations, the politicians, everyone who was part of making that new state. I will not comment on the right and the wrong of that creation happening. That new state was created at the expense of another. That, that's not what my role is in talking about this book. Um, but they were there. Now I get to tell you what it was like for three young girls and young boys, because the other two subsequently fell in love and married and had babies. And as I said, two of them still living there today, surrounded by their, their family and their friends, friends, many of whom actually still, several still alive, date back to those really, really big beginning, those first days when they were there. It wasn't easy, guys. It wasn't easy, but they, they were somewhere where, they no longer felt threatened, which goes kind of weird, isn't it? Because it was only six months ago. So I can tell you that Libby and Magda were being, were being threatened. Um, they were refusing to leave their home as missiles were being lobbied in on top of them. Uh, poor Magda, she refused to leave utterly. And she said the only sacrifice she made to her family was, well, when I hear the air raid sirens, I'll go and stand outside my apartment in the corridor because there's no windows there. Their story in those early days is just the spellbinding. Particularly, shall I say, can I, I'm going to single Libby out here because of a role she played there, a role which really should be recognised in history, but it won't be other than in, in my book because she was just a maid, as she put it, just a maid. But she was a maid in the home of the first president of Israel, Chaim Wiseman, and the first First Lady of Israel, Vera Wiseman. How she was treated and respected and revered by the First President and the First Lady of Israel says an awful lot about that man and that woman, I know. 
how they would tell her, particularly Kyle Wiseman, the president, when he would meet her out in the garden, their home, by the way, which is still in Rahobet, the presidential palace, they called it. It's a very big home. And the Wisemans made <clears throat> big gardens, they were big into gardens. And Livy became not only the maid for Vera, but also she became floral arranger for the whole house because she loved the gardens. So did President Wiseman. And they would meet in the garden. And he would tell her, the soil we stand on, young Livy, belongs more to you than it does to me. You have earned the right to stand on the soil and call this place home. You and the others who have made the ultimate sacrifice of your families. Now, not only did he talk to her like that, but the first Prime Minister of Israel, Ben Gurion, he used to have to come to visit the President in, in Tel Aviv because even though the Parliament was in Jerusalem, uh, Wiseman was quite unwell. In fact, he died as president and he died while the people were still working with him or for, look, for him with him. I don't know how to phrase that just quietly. <clears throat> but when Bern Gurin came to visit his president, he sought out Libby. He took her arm and he kissed the numbers on it every time he could find her. He too revered this young girl. And if she doesn't see it that way, to her, she was just an ordinary girl like everybody else. But I know this, not only from her, but from the other sisters in the family. Uh, that when she worked back late, Vera Wiseman would say to the president's driver, in this limousine, take her home. Home, by the way, for her and her husband, was a goat shed. that had previously housed goat on a small farm, goats on a small farm, a friend of theirs had. She jokes and laughs that when Ziggy, her husband, lay down at night and he stretched out full, his feet were outside. So it wasn't even big enough for him to lie straight on the floor. No beds there. That limousine is, can be seen today in the Wiseman house, which is now a museum. It still exists there. It was given to him by Henry Ford in person. Henry Ford made two of these incredible vehicles, only ever two. He gave one to President Roosevelt and he gave one to President Wiseman as his, you know, you're the, the president of this country and that exists here today. And Livy has written proudly in the back of it, <clears throat> being driven home because the driver would not let her drive up front. No, the first lady has said you are to sit in the back. But this role that this young girl had in that part of Israel's history, uh, you know, they, they don't feature, do they, the people who are there behind the scenes that exist today. Who's behind the scenes with our leaders who are making a difference? But they're never recorded. I'm so proud to be recording Libby's role as the maid in the Wiseman house. She goes there every now and then, takes her family to show them around and the guides that are there when they see her coming step aside and say look who we have here today we have somebody who now can take over and talk about this place both president wiseman and vera wiseman are buried there they say livy was there when he died and one of those photos you'll see in the back it's livy's wedding photo there is livy and her husband and standing beside her Vera Wiseman, who insisted on being at her wedding, even though she'd only recently lost her husband. <clears throat> so what I've got for you is a story that well, starts back in the 1920s with the promise by three girls. I end it because I had to end it in 1955 when the youngest of the, the children of the three sisters, the Muller girls, was born. Her name is Dorrit. Um, Sibby had two boys. Magda had two girls. Libby had a boy and a girl. I mean, you, you couldn't plan it, could you? Six cousins, three girls, three boys. There's now a smattering of, of uh, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Uh, and they are, I think, the luckiest kids. They now get to not only know about their family story, but they can proudly know that it's been shared around the world, and it will be. In doing the research for this, I don't just listen to the sisters. Of course, they are and the families. That's 95%, of course, of what the story is about, as they're telling. 
but I do go and do research in the background too, just to confirm things. And here's, a, here's an example of things I need to confirm. When writing about the Holocaust in particular, you do not get to deviate with the timelines, okay? <clears throat> I, I get smacked around enough by the odd academic and historian, for my, it's the way I write stories, but I never deviate from the timeline because it's there for everyone to know. So when Livy tells me that she remembers one day in Auschwitz on Birkenau eating an olive for the first time. She thought it was a grape when she found it and wrote some food because I used to try and smuggle food when they could. <clears throat> and she had this thing and it tasted revolting. It was not a plum. And it came because at that point in history, the people coming into Auschwitz-Birkenau, the Jewish boys and girls, came from Greece. And so for me, then going and researching you could, I can find that out. When did the girls and boys from Greece come in? Then I know how to insert that little vignette into my storytelling so that it ties in with the timeline of that happening. And there were several other things that Libby told me that, and she couldn't quite remember the day. She just knew of the events and knew who they were and what the people and the players were. It's not like she had a calendar on a wall every night. She could flip over and see the date and time. So the research I do does help me centre their story, their vignettes into the exact timeline of that horrific evil place we call Auschwitz-Birkenau. One of the other things I some of my research uncovered was that Libby is in fact a year older than she short, the short she was. I have a researcher back in Slovakia. She lives in Vladi's hometown of Krumpaki. And after COVID opened up a little bit there, she was able to go to the girls' hometown and she was able to get there from the bureaucrats who have been so helpful to me in my stories. They were, she was able to get and look at the births, the deaths and the marriages going back several generations of the girls. And I'd sent her the girls' names and their dates of birth as they had given it to me. And she was there at the time and she's ringing me up on the phone. It's night for me, morning for her in Slovakia. She says, OK, I found Sibi. And I found Magda, but the date of birth you've given me for Libby, it, it's not, I can't find it. She's not here. That's a bit of a worry. Thankfully, she was able to say, I'll just go looking. And then she brings me back. <clears throat> she says, I found a Mala baby being born exactly one year earlier. And that ties in, and it's the, the father's the same and the mother's the same. Two things are different. The year, it's a year earlier and the name. So I got to bring up Livy and say, hey, Livy, what's your name? And she said, Livy, Livia. Yeah, Livia is her name, she said, but people call me Livy. And the, the children call me Emma. And I said, can I run another name past you? And she said, yes. I said, what about Esther? And she said, oh, yes, that's my name. Because she was actually born and her name was registered as Esther. There's not a Livy in sight on her birth details. <clears throat> so for her family and her kids, it's all, what do you mean your name's not Livy? The authorities have been wonderful. They actually gave and had produced uh, official birth certificates for the girls, official death certificate for their father. And we uncovered another thing there, that researcher of mine, which was not known to the family at large. when. Linka, going through the documents, she just said, I just kept going, looking at births, deaths and marriages, rings me back, it's not well late into the night for me, and just casually says to me, do you want to know about the fourth sister? Back up. A fourth? She said, yes, I found a fourth sister. And she read out what she had found. And a little girl, Emilia, had been born three months after their father died. The children of those sisters did not know about her. But when I managed to get a conversation with Libby and I said, what about Amelia? And by the way, she died three years later of tuberculosis. We went, she then went and found her death certificate. Again, those things, those documents have also been provided to the family. And yeah, for them to have to learn. And when they asked Libby and Magda, who, who was Amelia? And they said, this is our baby sister. We think of her every day. And they've chosen to keep that to themselves. 
So when I was asked in an interview in London a couple of weeks ago, how do you know you've told everything there is to tell? You know, how do you know they haven't kept things from you? I mean, of course they've kept things from me and why the heck shouldn't they? Everyone's entitled to keep anything they want secret. This is not a memoir. I am not going to grill these girls. They have given me everything I want to know and everything I think you as readers should know. But yes, there was a fourth sister. And those girls, those sisters think about her every day, along with their now deceased sister, Sippy. Now, I've gone on longer than I should have, so I'm going to see if anyone's got any questions there. There are a couple, Heather. Thank you for that. That's such such a good answer to that question and such a detailed response, which is great. And there's such important stories that you share. Um, some of the questions that have come in, Janine's asked, is there a particular order that you should read your books? Oh, thanks, Janine. Not really, they stand alone. Uh, and, and I wrote them specifically like that. I could not know I was going to write a trilogy. I know that that word gets bandied about uh, with regard to them. Uh, it didn't start out that way. It started out with bloody story. Uh, then Silkers, of course, and this one wasn't even known about. In this one, both Silka and Lady and Gita are, of course, referenced and mentioned. The sisters, of course, are not mentioned in the other two because I did not know about them. They stand alone. Uh, and so you can read them separately. Mm -hmm. I think after this, you will know Lali and Gita and Silka. And I think you touched on this. Janine also wants to know, will your books be adapted into a movie? And you mentioned a TV series. Is that really happening or you maybe? Uh, it's happening for Lali's story, yes. Mm -hmm. The Tooth will be a six-part miniseries. Uh, it probably would have been on your screens by now but hadn't been for COVID. Mm -hmm. It's uh, being made in the, by UK producers with the assistance from other countries, uh, six-part folks going to come to you to a small screen, hopefully one day soon. Filming Fantastic. is problematic right now. But we'll watch out for that. Do you know if they cast the actors and all that already? Um, there's some thoughts going on with regard to that. I, I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to say anything that's no. sort of that's right. They'll give out press releases. I hope there'll be one coming out very soon that will enlighten you a little bit more. And uh, we've got a question. Do you have any idea when the diary will be published? So is that diary? Yeah, look, no, we, what happens with that diary is still being debated. Uh, we, know, we know that Magda and her family have asked that the original of it uh, will end up at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, as it should how it's treated. But right now we thought, well, let's just concentrate on getting the girl's story told like this and negotiations with the family on whether or not it gets published as a separate uh, book or it's just made available for academics. And that's all to be decided. And we'll take feedback from experts on the best way because it is a significant, a historically significant document written in real time. Hmm. Melina has said, thank you for sharing this awesome story. The research must have been so amazing and overwhelming at the same time. How do you know what to include in the books and or what to leave out? That's the challenge and it's a doozy. I think it comes down to how much do I think you folks want to read? Do you want to read War and Peace? And I suspect the answer is no. So it does come down to just picking those vignettes, those individual little storylines that can be linked nicely together um, and then talk about it like I am with you. But hopefully I'll get the opportunity very soon to travel some more. I'll be heading back down to Victoria in December to do some, some in-person talks. Hey, guys, I'm going to go and well, I'm actually going up into rural, uh, regional Victoria, Echuca, Kerrang, Woodham, Dalesford, Castle Maine, I'm coming your way in December. Uh, and I look forward to hopefully then also doing some more in Melbourne. It's and the rest of the world. Come on, come on, Qantas, get in the air. Another question from Tracy. Will you continue to find more survivors? Oh, there are plenty that have come to me. And yes, I have found. In terms of telling their stories, it's, yeah, they've all got a story. The question is, do they have a story that's, novel worthy or yeah of course it's novel worthy but is there enough in there to, to write a whole novel about for me I'm hoping that with the number of stories that have been sent to me and the publishers 
And I have this uh, website, by the way, and on there we've got a link uh, asking people to submit what we call stories of hope for the publishers there. It doesn't go straight onto the website. It goes to my publishers and, and we're collating them. Maybe a, a, a book of the short stories of several is the way to go. Because, oh, my gosh, you know, look, in one way there's six million stories to be told. But, hey, here's the thing, particularly when I'm talking at Jewish communities and when there are survivors there, many of them have come up to me in many, many countries and many towns and cities around the world and have said to me, thank you for telling Lali and Gita's story. And telling their story, you've told mine. I don't have to continue. I th that's another way of looking at it. The story of those six million are now being told not only by me, but by other authors who are now also writing in a historical fiction sense, stories of survival. Hmm. Janine has asked, do you have another work in progress at the moment or are you going to have a break? Thank you for the second part of that. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like a break, please. <laughs> I've written four books in under four years and I love traveling and I love being talking in person to people here and here everywhere. And I've asked, can I can I have a little bit of a break? By, by having a break doesn't mean not going and talking and traveling. But what it means is that, you know, when you send get me into Boston and you have me on morning television, afternoon TV, talking in the evening. And then the next morning, flying me to Chicago, where I then will do those three things again. And you won't even let me sleep in Chicago. You put me on a plane at midnight and send me to Toronto and Canada. Um, and then you repeat, repeat. I want to slow it down. I want to now get to these countries and into these towns and cities and say, right, I'm having the next 24 hours in Prague. I'm going to put my feet up. I'm going to enjoy this town or this city. What a best you can wait. I'll get there in a minute. I'm having an extended, I suppose you could say an extended book tour because I'm asking for it to be extended for me so that I can enjoy meeting people like you and enjoy being in the towns and the countries I'm in. Uh, the first part of your question, there's something on the burner, okay? Uh, yeah. But until we sort of officially agree to it, I'll, I'll keep it. You know, there's something, something coming. Um, you, you formed very strong connections, emotional connections with the people in your books. How do you cope with that sort of emotion when you're writing their stories? You know, Libby asked when I was over there last, I last got to Israel in January last year, just before the world went kaput. Um, and she asked if she could adopt me. Uh, her son and daughter, when they write to me, they, they just write to me, dear sister. Yes, I am really, really now part of these families, just like I was with Lali. How do I write it? Here's the weird thing about writing. When I'm writing the words, they're just coming from my fingers and onto the screen. I'm totally detached from what I'm writing. I actually, I don't get connected to it. It's weird. I think it's a self-preservation thing. I adapted or adopted subconsciously, but here's where it gets me. When I then the next day try and read what I've written, I can't, that, that is a real struggle for me. That's the breakdown. Oh my gosh. Write the words, don't ask me to read them. Yeah. Self preservation, I think it is. And what sort of things do you do to relax then when you're not writing? The same thing that Libby does. I discovered that we, she and I have this shared passion for doing jigsaw puzzles. And when I'm with her, because I spend most of my time when I'm in Israel with Libby because she has really good English, and Magda not so much. Magda understands more than she ever says to me in English. So I spend a lot of time with Libby and we sit at her dining table. She's always got a large 1500, 2000 piece jigsaw puzzle and we'll sit on either side of the table and fight over whose piece that really is. And she'll mess up some of mine if she thinks I'm putting in too many and take some out. But, you know, during that time is also when unscripted and without any pressure, because no one else, none of the family are around, that has also been when I've heard some of the very, very personal and deeply emotional parts of the story because we're distracted, both of us doing a jigsaw. She might think I'm distracted, but actually I'm taking it in. 
<laughs> and I also do my own. I've always, always got one on the go too. Perfect. I think that might be the end of the questions that people have put up on the chat. And we have come to almost an hour talking to you, Heather. And thank you very much for coming tonight. I think we'll wrap it up there. We'll look forward to seeing you in person in Victoria or somewhere around the country if we're travelling. And um, if you, don't forget, if you want to win a copy of the book, answer the You've question, what are the names name. of the sisters? Livia, Amanda and Sibi, C-I-B-I. Okay,